Welcome back to our study in the book of Revelation. We're going through this great book to reveal who Jesus was. Did you know in the early church that it wasn't just called Revelation, that it was actually referred to as the revelation of Jesus Christ? And that is what we are going through to realize more than anything is that we have a coming king who is coming to rule and reign and judge the world. And John takes this book, puts it together, and compiles a revelation of Jesus Christ. And I'm praying and hoping that as we go through the study today, we get that. That something new pops out, that you don't walk away going, well, I, I knew that, or I, I mean, I've done a bad job if I haven't taught through this properly, that we could get something new out of this. And so my hope and prayer is that not only something new comes, but it is so uh, powerful in, in, in revealing to us that it, it causes us to have a new found appreciation for who Jesus is in our life. And we're going to go through Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13 today. It's the church in Philadelphia. I'll tell you, next week we're going to wrap up the seven churches with the church at Laodicea. And then we're going to get into a lot of what the book of Revelation is known for with um the rapture of the tribulation, the imagery, um, the things to come, the end times, the prophecy, all that type of stuff. That'll begin in a couple weeks. But as we get into this church at Philadelphia, this is probably the church, well, not probably, it is the church that was commended the most out of the seven churches. Uh, as we go through this, it's very hard-pressed to find something that Jesus was not... Um, not loving along the way and what they were doing. And so speaking of love, you know, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, that is what um, Philadelphia means. It means brotherly love. And so here we go. Let's dive into this. Let's get some application on this. I'm going to read these verses, this letter to the church at Philadelphia. We're going to break it down. And then like we've been doing along the way, we're going to bring some life application to what Jesus was saying to the church. How many of you know that although this was written to a church, it's still written to us, not only as a church, but as a believer, and we can take great things from this, and we'll tie it in with some other scripture along the way. So let's get into verse number seven here. It says, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, and who opens, and no one will shut and who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Verse 9, Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Let's break this down. Let's apply what we can to our life. Father, thank you for the word. Please drill it deep into our hearts. Again, like we talked about at the beginning, we want a revelation of you, Jesus. I pray that we see you in a new way, a deeper way, and that it transforms our life through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going to break this down, but a question I want to pose that we're going to answer as we go along in our study today is this. How do we, as a church, advance in what God has called us to do? How do we as a church advance in what God has called us to do? 
Now, you may be sitting there watching this going, well, I'm not a part of Cornerstone Church. Well, think of the church that you attend. And if you're not yet or currently at a church right now that you've you've rooted yourself in, think of it this way. How as a believer can I advance in what God has called me to do? As God has called us to some wonderful things, and and along the way, we're going to have different things that come up. So how do we advance along the way? And so he writes, and and he opens up in verse 7. Let's break this down here. He talks about he, Jesus, claims he is the Holy One. Now, this is claimed in the book of Acts three different times. If you go to Acts 2.27, Acts 13.34, Acts 13.35, Jesus is written about as the Holy One. And then it says the true one. True in the Greek means genuine. The genuine article, if you will. There is no fake. There is there's nothing about him who pretends to be this and is not. He is the true one. He is the genuine one. He is the Son of God, in other words. And then it says something interesting here. Who has the key of David? Who has the key of David? If you go back to... Uh, chapter 1, we went over the fact that Jesus has the, the keys of death in Hades. And he refers to here the key of David. And it says, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens. Now bear with me. I'm a teacher at heart. I, I want to break this down. Because it's so easy to get into this type of, of scripture here. I mean, let's read this. And let's read it as if it was the most glorious thing that we've ever heard, okay, that Jesus is sitting on high like he is, and is preeminent like he is, and it just stirs something inside of us, and we go, Jesus has the key of David, and he opens, and no one's going to shut, and he shuts, and no one's going to open. That's powerful, and it is powerful, but what does it mean? If I was to ask you right now, what does that statement mean? Where, Where is that drawn from in the Bible? Would we be able to answer that? And, and and some of us, maybe, yeah, hopefully. But most of us, I would I would reckon that, no, we, we couldn't say what that means and give context to it. And so allow me for a moment to, to, to teach and to expand and expound on this statement because it is key to understanding who Jesus is, and it will give us a revelation of who he is. So if you would go with me to Isaiah chapter 22. Isaiah chapter 22, we're going to see this statement specifically talked about in Isaiah chapter 22. And as you're going there, I want to give some context for what we're about to read. Um, This is an actual event, okay? There's a couple of particular people that are talked about in this passage, okay? One of them is named Shebna. Shebna was currently in charge at the station that's going to be talked about here, but he had a lot of pride. He was doing things in a wrong way, and God was going to send rebuke and correction along the way in that. And then there's this this gentleman named Eliakim. Eliakim comes, and he's going to replace Shebna and take over doing what he was going to do. Uh, This actually happened. These were actual people that's being written about actual events, but this is also a type. What is a type? It's a picture. And oftentimes we have a type of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, meaning it's a picture of who Jesus is written in the Old Testament. And this is actually a type, a picture of Jesus and Satan in these verses. So I'm going to read these verses along the way. I'm going to explain some stuff, and we're going to understand more about Jesus and this whole idea of opening and shutting and not opening and not being able to shut, all this type of stuff. So let's go into verse 15. Let's break this down along the way. Let's understand the Bible together, okay? It says in verse 15, Thus says the Lord God of hosts, Come, go to the steward, to Shebna, who is over the household, So Shebna has authority, he has jurisdiction. Say to him, in verse 16, What have you to do here? And whom have you here? That you have cut out here a tomb for yourself, you who cut out a tomb on the height, and carve a dwelling for yourself in the rock. Now what was going on 
historically here is that the elite, the royal, the prestige, the wealthy, when they died, they had tombs that were cut out of rocks, out of stones, out of mountains, and these were palatial tombs. Most people were sadly not even buried during this time, so to have an actual tomb in the side of a mountain was a big deal. And this man Shebna was not of that position, and he was not to do that, yet he's found doing this, and so he's confronted on this. So we go into verse 17. Behold, the Lord will hurl you away violently, O you strong man. He will seize firm hold of you and whirl you around and around and throw you like a ball into a wide land. Time out for a second. So this is Shebna. This is the prophecy against Shebna. But Shebna illustrates he's a type of Satan. This man, Shebna, was full of pride, full of arrogance, doing things that were not in his authority to do. And he is being prophesied against that he's going to be hurled away, that he's going to be thrown around and around and put into a, a, a desolate land, so to speak. This is a picture of Satan. Satan was in a picture, a position of authority. He would be, he became prideful. He was cast out of heaven into a wide land, earth here, where he still has jurisdiction and reign for some time. But do you see the correlation here between this man Shebna and the type and picture of Satan along the way? So continuing in verse 18, he says, There you shall die, and there shall be your glorious chariots, you shame of your master's house. Satan became the shame of God's house. Verse 19, I will thrust you from your office, and it will be pulled down from your station. This is what happened to Shebna. This is what happened to Satan. And now we get into verse 20. And that day I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe and will bind your sash on him and will commit your authority to his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the house of Judah. Now, we're getting into this man Eliakim, who's going to take the place of this. That which was Shebna's is now going to be given to this man Eliakim. And we can see this picture of Jesus Christ represented as Eliakim here. He is going to come down. He is going to take the authority that Satan once had, and he's going to rule over the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The line of Judah is where he's going to come from. This is a picture of Jesus. In verse 22, and I will place him on his shoulder. Here we go. Here's language that we just heard from Revelation. The key of the house of David, he shall open. And none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. And I will fasten him like a peg in a secure place, and he will become a throne of honor to the Father's house. And they will hang on him the whole honor of his Father's house. This is what Jesus did. The offspring and issue, every small vessel from the cups to all the flagons. And verse 25 finishes this up, and it refers back to Shebna and a type of Satan here. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, the peg that was fastened in a secure place will give way. Amen. And thank you, Jesus, for that. And it will be cut down and fall, and the load that was on it will be cut off. The Lord has spoken. So here we are in these verses here. Let me come back to Revelation 3, verse 7. And it says, the key of David, who opens and none will shut, and who shuts and none opens. Not only do you now see where that was drawn from in the book of Isaiah, but the context behind that and how powerful this really is now. That which was given over in authority for Satan and in how he badly stewarded it and how he fell, how he was prideful, Jesus comes and replaces that. And now he's the one that holds all of the keys. And he is able to open that which cannot be shut. And he's able to shut that which will never be open. Now to further illustrate this and to go back to that passage in Isaiah and put a nice little bow on this in a profound way. Back in the day of Shebna and Eliakim, uh, they were in the palace. In the palace, there were obviously doors that went into rooms and obviously keys that would unlock doors. 
uh, there was also a master key. And a master key was obviously if you could not open the door, if you lost the key, if something happened, you had to have a master key that could open every single door. The thing was, the way it worked, is that if a door was locked and you did not have the key to open the door and you had to open that door with a master key, once that master key was used, the other keys that were once able to open that door and lock it would no longer be able to open it. Not only that, they would not be able to shut it and lock it. And likewise, if you were to lock the door with the master key, no longer would the key that was used before to open it be able to open it. Jesus holds the master key. That which he goes in and opens can no longer be locked by anything else. That which he goes in and locks cannot be opened by anything else but the master key. And Jesus is the one that holds all of this. And that is a revelation of Jesus Christ that I hope is profound to you, that he holds the keys. If we go back again to Revelation 1, he holds the keys of death and Hades. He holds the keys to life and death. And that which he opens, no one can shut. That which he closes, no one is able to open. He is the final authority. He is the king of kings. He is the judge. This is Jesus Christ. Woo, that was good. That was good. Now he speaks to this church, and in verse 8 he goes, I know your works. I know your works. And again, this is something that Jesus repeats to every church, and it's something that we need to really just be mindful of. Jesus knows the works of a church. He knows the works of our life, and he is watching us at all times. That shouldn't scare us and cause us to to walk in fear, it should cause us to walk in reverence of him. Amen? Amen. Now he goes on into verse 8, and he says, Behold, I've set an open door before you. <laughs> they were doing so well that the one who can open a door has opened a door for them. And he says, which no one is able to shut. This is powerful. They were doing such a wonderful job in their representation of Jesus as a church that God is opening a door for them along the way. And they're able to do this because, again, he which opens, no one is able to shut. And then this powerful statement here, but we're going to drive home later on here. I know that you have but little power. And this wasn't a diss on them. This wasn't to say, oh, you, you just, you don't have very much. Because of what they had gone through, and because, you know, think of this, like if you've ever played an old video game, like a Mike Tyson uh, boxing game, the original one on Nintendo, you know, you had that power meter. <laughs> and every time you get hit, that power would go down. I mean, you start off with full power in the fight, but every time you get hit, every time you get punched, that power continues to go down. And this was what was going on with the church in Philadelphia. A lot of persecution, a lot of people coming against them, hitting them. Their power had gone down, and it was just a tiny bit remained. He says, yet, in all of that, you kept my word and have not denied my name. This is key. This is so key. We'll get into this a little bit later on. They had a little power left, but they had not deviated from their faith. And then we get into verse 9 here, and he talks about, again, this synagogue of Satan. I explained that in detail at the Church of Smyrna. You can go to a couple sermons back in that to reference that. Um, but basically, these, these Jews who pretend to be Jews, they're not really Jews, actually. Um, Jesus says, I'm going to make them come down and, and bow before you. And, and this is imagery. It's not like they would literally come down and bow before the church at Philadelphia. But this is a little bit of a role reversal that John is playing with here and, and that Jesus is talking about as they're, as they're putting this letter together. You, you see, the Israelites, the Jews, are God's chosen people. From the time of Abraham till the very end, when they, they come into the revelation of Jesus Christ, truly for who he is, the Savior that they missed, that they crucified, they're God's chosen people. Um, Outside of the Israelites are Gentiles, and, and, and up until Jesus came, uh, the Gentiles were not God's people. 
they were not going to be saved. And now Jesus dying and reconciling to himself all people, now the Gentiles get to come in. And before, it was just the Jews. Now it's the Gentiles and the believing Jews and this imagery that they're going to recognize that Jesus has opened the door for Gentiles to be saved. They're going to recognize that. They're going to learn that God loves them just as much as he loves his chosen people, the Israelites. It goes into verse 10 and says, Because you've kept my word about patient endurance, I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world. Now, last week I described in some tribulation and things happening, that did not refer to the actual seven-year tribulation, the rapture of the church, but this one actually does. This is one of the first verses in Revelation that we understand the tribulation happening, but the rapture of God's people before the tribulation starts. So I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to those who dwell on earth. Those that believe in Jesus that numerous times, and Jesus talks about conquering, overcoming to the end, are going to be raptured before this tribulation occurs. And in verse 11, he emphasizes, I'm coming soon. I'm coming soon. We don't know how soon is. We don't know the hour. We don't know the day. But it's coming soon. Hold fast to what you have, he says, so that no one may seize your crown. And this, again, just speaks on what this book is about. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So find out who he is. Put your belief and faith in him and hold fast against all persecution, against everything that comes your way, against all uh, uh, temptations to lose your faith. Hold fast to the end that we're going to remain having our crown like other verses in ch the churches have said, be clothed in white garments. And then uh, a, a thing that we've referred to back in chapter 2, verse 17, this whole thing about a new name that we see here in verse 12, uh, talks about this new name. And if you go back to that church of Pergamum, again, a couple sermons back, I talk about in reference that this is not necessarily this new name that we're going to receive, but the new name that we're going to see of who God is. It's God's name. And we can see that played out here. He says, I'm going to write on him the name of my God, the name of my God. We're going to be written. We're going to have the mark of God in our life, over us, on us. In contrast to that, those that don't are going to receive the mark of the beast. And so you can see here that there's clearly a distinction of those who are gods and those who are the devils in eternity. And that's a sobering thought. And I'll say this. Uh, we talk so much about the mark of the beast. Mark of the beast. It's coming. And there's this fear tactics involved in all of that and the evangelizing of all of that. We need to talk more about this mark of God that we're going to receive as believers, that we're going to receive God's name when we get to heaven. We're going to be marked with that. We should be proclaiming that more than we need to talk about the mark of the beast. And that breaks down the, the verses here in this, in this letter to the church at Philadelphia. And, and what I want to do is not just, again, fill us with knowledge, but let's put some application to this. And, and so we asked the question earlier, how do we as a church advance in what God has called us to do? How do I as a believer advance in what God has called me to do? Now, I'll preface this with a story. A lot of times in my life, I've just I've been so invigorated, so passionate to serve God. And along the way, uh, things, circumstances have happened numerous times in my life where I do not feel as qualified as I once did. I don't feel like I can give it 100% like I did before. And uh, a lot of times in my life, I've just, I've kind of got into the checkout mode. Like if I can't give my all, then I, I don't deserve to give anything. If I can't give my all, I'm ineffective. What good am I? And I don't know if that resonates with you in any way. Maybe you, you've, you've tried to serve in church at some point in your life. And at some point, man, you were giving it your all. And then circumstances happen. Life, hello, it happens. 
And along the way, you, you, you go, wow, I'm not doing as good as I once did before. Maybe I should just stop altogether and maybe I should um, maybe even look for a new church. It's not working out here. We can get into a whole bunch of stuff with all of that. My main point in all of this is that along the way, we are called to advance God's church. And sometimes life gets in the way. Sometimes circumstances come and they stop us. Sometimes the door has been swung wide open by Jesus, and we just don't have what it takes to walk through. And uh, and so, again, this thought of no condemnation, but how how do we as a church, how do I as a believer advance in what God has called us to do? I want to give us four points and how they relate back here to what we just read in Revelation. The first thing here is we remain a church with power. And again, if you're not a part of Cornerstone Church or you're not um, a part of any church right now and you just want to insert a uh, believer instead of church, that's fine. How do uh, we advance in what God has called us to do? Number one, we remain a church with power. We remain a believer with power. And, and Jesus declared to the church at Philadelphia, I know you have but little power, but yet you kept my word and have you not, you've not denied my name. We remain a church with power. Even if we've got punched to the point where we've fallen down, we get back up in the little strength that we have. You see, this is a big difference in what Jesus was writing to the church at Philadelphia but versus the other churches. Other churches, he's like, you fell. You completely fell. Um, other churches, uh, you're not continuing on. This church, they have a little power left, but they're, they're going for it. They're continuing in that power. And no matter what circumstances come our way, no matter what life brings, if we remain in Jesus, we still have power. It may feel like little power to us, again, because we're comparing it to our own power before. We have to realize that the power of Jesus Christ, never it never goes down. It's never punched to the point where it diminishes. Whatever hits Jesus has zero effect on him. And so even if we have a little power, it is mighty in the name of Jesus Christ. So we are going to advance in what God has called us to do by remaining a church, a believer with power. How do we do that? We do what we can and we do it well. Hear me out on this. We do what we can and we do it well. It doesn't mean we have to do all of these things. We just do what we can in the moment, and we make sure we do it well. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says this, whatever your hand, your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. If you can do 10 things, do it with your might. If you can do five things, do it with your might. If you can do one thing, do it with the strength that you have and the strength you can get from Jesus. The second thing here, on how do we advance in what God has called us to do? We remain a church with possibilities. Remain a believer with possibilities. Uh, the church in Philadelphia, Jesus says, I have set before you an open door. I've set before you an open door. This imagery of an open door was seen throughout the New Testament. I'm just going to throw a, a few verses at you pretty quickly here. 1 Corinthians 16, 9. For a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. 2 Corinthians 2.12, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was opened for me in the Lord. Uh, Colossians 4.3, at the same time, pray for us also that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. And then in Acts 14, 27, it says, And then they arrived and gathered the church together. They declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. We are going to remain a church with possibilities. We are going to remain a believer with possibilities because with God, all things are possible. And we have a Savior in Jesus Christ who opens doors which no one can shut. So how do we do this? 
We build his church. We build his church. Now here at Cornerstone Church, we are in 2024, and this year is about building his church. We have five specific ways that we are building his church this year. Now, you as a believer, you can build his church. If you're not currently attending a church, I highly encourage you. It is biblical that you are rooted in a church. And whatever your hand can find to do, do it with your might. Build his church. If you are in a church right now and you don't find yourself serving, serve the body of Christ. Again, it doesn't have to take all of your time, but we are going to advance God's kingdom through the door that he has opened for us. we got to walk through that door and remaining a church with possibilities by continuing to steward and what he's called us to build. Again, how do we advance and what God has called us to do? Thirdly, we remain a church with purpose, with, oh, sorry, with promise. We remain a church with a promise. We remain a believer with promise. He says to the church in Philadelphia, I will keep you. I will keep you. God is keeping you. God has a promise over your life, and he has that as a yes and amen. And as long as we can remain a church, a believer with promise, God will work that promise through and through. Listen, we are called to have faith. We are called to have faith. So how do we remain a church? How do we remain a believer with promise? We keep the faith. We keep the faith. We endure with faith. Our job is to keep the faith. God's job is to keep the promise. And when we keep the faith, God is faithful in his promise to us. 1 Peter 5.10 says this, After you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. After you've suffered for a little while, these are the promises that are coming to you. We just need to keep the faith and the promise that God has for us. And lastly, how do we advance in what God has called us to do? We remain a church with perseverance. We remain a believer with perseverance. It, it remarked, Jesus remarked, I should say, in the letter to Philadelphia, I will make him a pillar. I will make him a pillar. I didn't go over that before because I was going to go over that now. But this idea of a pillar, it's so important. If you look at a structure, you can visibly see the importance of a pillar. And a pillar is a permanency. It's there to hold for all time. And we have to remain in perseverance. We have to remain in perseverance. So how do we do that? How do I remain a believer? How do we remain as a church with perseverance? We remain faithful. Faithful. And you're like, Pastor Ryan, that sounds like the last point. Like, how do we do that? We keep the faith. Keeping the faith and remaining faithful is different. I can keep the faith in my mind, but am I remaining faithful throughout the process? I can say, God, I have faith in you, but am I remaining faithful in the trial? It's the proof in the pudding, so to speak, and that's what perseverance is. It's the long suffering. It's the going through it and and not deviating from the promise that God has for us. And I'll end it with this verse to drive this point home. In Genesis 2, 22, 1, it says this, After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. After these things, God tested Abraham. What are these things? Think of Abraham's life. He's called by God to leave the comforts of his home and go to a land that he doesn't know where it's at, how he's going to get there, when he's going to get there, and what it's going to be like when he gets there. He's called to do that. Uh, he's given a promise that he's going to be a father, and not only that, but his, his the descendants were going to lead to Jesus Christ. And For 25 years, there is nothing remotely coming close to that promise being fulfilled. He had to remain faithful in that. He had numerous issues with his family. He had to go in the original 300 style and and save his nephew Lot, who got captured by enemies. All of these things happened for Abraham, to Abraham, along the way. And he had to remain faithful. And he comes to this point where God... Had, had called his name, 
and he was about to test him. Do you know what he was about to test him in, in in chapter 22? Sacrificing his son Isaac on the altar. And he's going to test him in that. And he's been tested throughout all his life. And he's remained faithful. And he's going to continue to remain faithful. His response to God, here I am. Here I am. And God tells him, you're going to take your son, you're going to go up to this mountain, and you're going to sacrifice your only son. Sound familiar? By the way, did you know that this place that Abraham was taking Isaac up to is the same place that Jesus is going to be crucified? His response is, here I am. Despite all the things that he's gone through, despite what's about to happen, he says, here I am. Here I am. And this is my challenge to every single one of us and what I've been challenged in. In all of this, God has laid an open door, just like the church in Philadelphia. There is an open door in our life to advance and what God has called us to do. Listen, along the way, our power is going to get diminished, but through the power of Jesus Christ, it'll never go away. Along the way, there are going to be possibilities that come up. Are we going to steward those? Along the way, the promise of God is going to remain as long as we got to keep the faith in this. And along the way, there's going to be trials, but there's a perseverance that we have the power of Jesus Christ. Will we be able to say, here I am, Lord. Use me. Use me. And maybe you don't feel worthy to be used right now. Maybe you're new in the faith and you're like, how do I even do this? Wherever you're at right now, I want you to know that, first of all, you are worthy. Second of all, that you are called. Thirdly, that you've been given gifts. And we're to use all of these things to advance what God has provided for us in an open door. Let me pray for you, and I hope that you take that which you've received today and put it to work this week. Father, thank you for what you've given us. I pray that those who have listened to this are encouraged, first of all, and that you stir faith in them, to remind them that, first of all, you are faithful, and because you are faithful, we can then be faithful. And I pray with all of my heart that something wakes up inside of us that sees that you have opened a door for us to walk through, and we are called to walk through that door. And whatever is hindering us from doing so, I pray that that is removed in the power of Jesus Christ, and that you give us the strength, the wisdom, and the courage to do that which you have called us to do, and to give us the perseverance to finish it out. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Be blessed as you continue through your week.